tonight I release my delegates and alternates who have come to this convention and urge you and all of my friends across America to give your enthusiastic support to our party, to our platform, and our presidential and vice presidential nominees. We were shocked, all of us shocked. We had pulled 81% of the evangelical vote in the general election. We lost the Jewish vote, of course, which we lose. We lost the black vote, which we always lose. We lost the Hispanic vote, which we always lose. We lost all those votes. We were the first elected president in modern times to lose the Catholic vote. It meant you could win with just evangelicals. We won 81% of the evangelical vote. It had never been done before. President Bush was meeting with a group of clergymen. At one point he said, well, you know, I used to have a drinking problem, which is an amazing thing for him to say, because he doesn't like to acknowledge that. I used to have a drinking problem, and by rights, at this moment, I should be sitting on a bar stool in Texas instead of in this office. And the only reason I'm here is because I found God and because of the power of prayer. He truly was wandering, and he really was a prodigal son. He was uh, out in the desert uh, and having a good time, though. He was drinking a lot, staying out late, dating and knowing a lot of women. Uh, th this is his description of it. I think his dad probably did practice, as the prodigal's father did, to let his son go and do and, and run to the end of himself. Internally in the family, and I think among his friends as well, there was a sense that he was going too far, that it might be dangerous at some level. There are stories uh, in Texas about George W. Uh, uh, perhaps having, you know, one too many cool beverages and suddenly um, appearing on stage uninvited in the background at a Willie Nelson, you know, concert. Um, I just guess from having lived in Texas for a while that there were other people up there doing the same thing. I don't know that many of them would go on to run for governor and then run for, for the presidency of the United States. George was a, was a good guy, and he was one of the guys. He was not special. <laughs> he was a neat guy in the oil business that I knew. You know, he was one of the people of Midland. He came in here in the late 70s like a, a lot of other young men. He had connections. Lots of young guys had connections. Midland in the 60s, many Easterners' sons came out here because it was the place to be. When money's rolling in, people tend to live it up. There were skyscrapers planned and, and Learjets were bought and people went to country clubs and played fast and loose. I myself uh, did more drinking and more partying than certainly I should have. And that's what we thought you wanted to be when you grew up to become a man is be a hard drinking, hard driving oil man. The problem is, in 1982, the price of oil was between $35 and $40 a barrel. By 1986, it was $10 a barrel. People were losing money rapidly. We were all, about that time, trying to figure out how we were going to get out of the mess that the oil and gas business had gotten into. We were kind of in a survival mode. Despite his family connections, George W's attempts to forge his own oil business were also foundering. Nearing the age of 40, Bush's future was filled with uncertainty. A lot of us were looking at what is reality, what really matters in life. I had a beautiful wife, George had a beautiful wife, beautiful kids. If that's not enough, what is? Everybody has a hole, what Blaise Pascal called the hole in the human heart. I don't care whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're in jail, whether you're in prison. Why am I here? Uh, why is this sin and suffering? Is there any way out of it? What's my purpose in life? Those are questions that have plagued people as long as recorded human history. I don't care whether you're a George Bush son of privilege who happened to have an alcohol problem. Everybody's going to be thinking about that sometime in LA. In response to Midland's economic crisis, Local churches took the unusual step of banding together for a Christian revival. This crusade 
would be led by traveling evangelist Arthur Blessed. First Baptist Midlands pastor warned us that we would not be ready for him. He literally has carried a 12 by 6 foot cross, 90 pounds, around the world to every known country. I was amazed that Arthur Blessed could fill the place, which says something about both the city of Midland and maybe the need at the time and the move of the Holy Spirit. The next night, one would think I would have gone. I was more interested in watching the finals of the NCAA basketball championships, and two friends of mine, Joe O'Neill and George Bush, were invited over to my house, and we were going to watch the game and play sports trivial pursuit. George happened to get there early, and uh, Joey wasn't there yet, and we just started talking, shooting the breeze, and he said, well, what'd you do last night? And I said, I went to the thing at Shap Center. He goes, oh, so did I. And I said, uh, well, what'd you think? He goes, I think he's, you know, he's, he's, he's real deal. During the day, Arthur would carry the cross down through town or over to Odessa, and after the Crusades at Midland Shop Center at night, there would be a group of people uh, normally that would come over to our house. And we just talked, just like a couple of guys, and uh, he said, so if you died tonight, Don, do you have assurance that you would be in heaven? And I said, yes, Arthur, I do. And uh, he goes, well, that's just great. And then he got up to leave, and I went, wait. Will you pray with me? And so I got down on the floor with him and a group of people. We prayed a very powerful prayer for me. And I felt, this sounds really weird, because when I hear people say this, I go, yeah, sure. But I felt big white lightning bolts coming out of my shoulders. And I felt like, even though I was on my knees, I felt like I was about three feet off the ground. And I did have all of my burdens lifted from me. I became aware that George Bush wanted to meet Arthur. And so the three of us ended up at the Holiday Inn. We may have been the only three in there other than our waitress. George was very straightforward. He was wanting to visit with Arthur about what it meant to come to know Jesus personally. The three of us with heads bowed and Arthur uh, leading in prayer, the sinner's prayer is what I would normally call it. George prayed that prayer. And why God chose to move in our president's heart at that time, I don't know. I'm just glad he did. At age 40, he tells his own story. It's in writing. That he uh, stopped drinking. And he had been drinking quite heavily. I think he was addicted. He quit. And since age 40 to this present day, he says he hasn't touched alcohol. He's a new man in Christ. I think that he is not the George Bush of yesteryear. George W. Bush was 40 years old. He'd worn off alcohol, had begun to think more seriously about himself as a believer, but had frankly not made much of his life, and knew in his own mind that he had one last chance to get his act together, both for daddy's sake and for himself. Thank you very much. I am here today to announce my candidacy for President of the United States. George W. Bush came to work for his father just as Bush Sr. faced a growing religious right movement. Thank you all very much. The younger Bush's newfound evangelical identity would prove pivotal to the campaign. George H.W. Bush, the father, always had a somewhat strained relationship with the evangelical Christian community. I'm not a mystic, and I don't yearn to lead a crusade. My ambitions are perhaps less dramatic, but they're no less profound. He had been in the moderate wing of the Republican Party on cultural issues. His own father had been a crusader for population control and condom distribution, an entirely different cultural world from the one of the South and the Bible Belt. And so when George H.W. Bush tried to curry favor in that crowd, he was always a little bit off. Sometimes he was a little too fervent, and then he would be aghast at his own ferventness. Uh, he just couldn't get it quite right because he didn't hear the music. I prayed plenty, and I can't tell you what about yeah. private between me and the... 
the Lord. Another president? We were trying to get his dad elected president. And the numbers of evangelicals just grown. And the popular fiction in the newspapers constantly was, well, they've peaked. Well, it's over. Well, now they're closing their doors at moral majority. Well, now this. So it, there was this constant news story every three or four months that they peaked. But according to Gallup's numbers, they hadn't peaked. They were just continuing to grow.